now legal in 2022 could be the biggest year yet for global cannabis legalization. But there are serious problems. Canada to Lebanon, criminal groups are not giving up their businesses, and giant corporations are taking over the emerging legal markets. Well, you've got people that aren't even from Los Angeles coming in and raking in huge profits from a business and a industry that we created. We created this, they didn't create this. I'm J.S. Raffaelli. I've spent years writing about drugs, why people take them, and why our governments chose to declare war on them. At Vice, we make a lot of films about drugs, but in this show, I get to dig a bit deeper. I get to talk to fellow expert drug nerds about their research into the crazy world of mind-altering substances. What an exciting time to be engaged, particularly in the cannabis debate. Paul North is the director of the cannabis think tank VoltFast. In this episode, we're going to figure out who's doing best in creating legal cannabis markets and which countries need to up their game. Paul, good to see you, man. How's it going? Yeah, good to see you too, mate. I'm all right. Right now, so many US states and countries across the world are legalizing cannabis to certain extents. Can you give us just like a lightning overview about where we're at with this? I think what we're seeing globally is very quickly, policymakers and governments are seeing the immense benefits to change in our current drug policies. We've seen 50 years plus globally of massive failures when it comes to dealing with the problems caused by drugs. In the last five years, I've seen a massive shift and change. And we've gone from a discussion around, should we change our drug law? Should we legalize cannabis? Yes or no? Now the discussion that we're having is what should that look like? Because even when you engage social conservatives on this issue or groups that traditionally are anti-reform and have supported prohibition for years, even those groups are looking at the situation and saying, this isn't right, this isn't working. But legalizing something that's been illegal for so long is never gonna be simple, right? And I'm interested in how different criminal markets around the world are reacting to this. Like, the cartels aren't just gonna pack up and go home, are they? This is where the issue becomes exceptionally complicated. Because in those 50 years of failure, criminal gangs have got incredibly powerful, incredibly influential, and they're making a lot of money. The illegal market is basically the most free market you can possibly think of. It's a libertarian's dream in many ways. When you compete with that, it makes it very difficult because you're up against the freest of markets that can deliver to your door whenever it wants, round the clock. It can change its prices in an instant. It pays zero tax. It can recruit people for next to nothing in any age bracket. It could have 14 year olds, 15 year olds, 16 year olds running around selling drugs regulated sensible businesses and industries can't do that and rightly so but when it comes to introducing models to tackle that you're up against a lot of resistance if you legalize cannabis if you can't make it cheaper make it a better quality of product make it quicker in terms of delivery to the consumer how are you going to eliminate that illicit market the territory where we've probably got the most data is probably canada right how are they doing with sort of limiting the illicit market and getting people on to buying from the legal trade? I think it is fair to say that it's not been as successful as they would have liked it to have been. The more recent stats suggest it's around the 50-60% of the legal market. So even though that model's been only been around for two, three years, it is slowly moving in the right direction. But a lot of people still access the illicit market. When you go and speak to those individuals, you know, why are you still accessing the illicit market? Cost quality of product and ease of access. Those were the initial criticisms of the Canadian market. And one would have to say that a 50% reduction in any other form of crime would probably be held as pretty major success, right? The beauty of this, the beauty of policy, is you can change it and edit it over time. So what Health Canada can do is they can listen to consumers, hear that, oh, it's a pricing issue. Okay, well, let's adjust and change the pricing issue. You know, you, you can make, you can tinker it and make those changes to, to move it along. I'm thinking about places like Lebanon and maybe Morocco, where people who are producing the cannabis actually actively want to fight against the government legalizing because it might take away their market. I mean, this is a, this is one of the challenges. This this is the issue you've got off the back of years and years and years of prohibition. We're not talking about small time people. We're talking about serious players with huge access to resources 
in, in some places with access to government and policy makers. So it can be a challenge. You're right in those cases, you know, Lebanon, Morocco, but Mexico is going to be really interesting as well. That's been on the agenda for a long time and they, they're definitely going to do it. When that comes to fruition, it's going to be very interesting. How do cartels with exceptional amounts of wealth and influence and power, how do they interact with this emerging legal market? Todo esta área de nosotros, el ganado, la agricultura, también sembramos motas, solfia. This is so far away from any city. Do the police ever come by here? Así han llegado a venir, pero solo pasan por caminos y uno ya mismo que si ellos vienen en buen plan, pues nosotros en buen plan, nosotros cooperamos con ellos. Y si ellos vienen en modo agresivo contra nosotros, pues nosotros nomás repelemos la agresión. So, top of the league and bottom of the league for dealing with the illicit market. Who's doing the best, who's doing the worst? Canada, I think, is probably, though, the best example because it's on the, it's on the right track, but it's taking public health seriously. Well, they've been very Canadian about the issue, to be honest. They've been very methodical and not rushed to the, like, let's do the, the maddest, most exciting thing we could possibly do. So, it's legalization 1.0. We are entering the unknown somewhat. Now, a lot of people do have concerns that the newly emerging legal market will be captured by a few giant cannabis corporations, right? Where have we seen that happen? And has anyone actually managed to avoid it? So there are certainly concerns that exist around big corporations capturing the market. The reality of the situation is that the North American market, Canada in particular, is dominated by a lot of large corporations. Now, one thing that is particularly concerning for me as, as an advocate is I do want to see those corporations engaged in the the system, but I also want to see kind of craft cultivators. I want to see a little bit of diversity. Part of the challenge is because the tax rates are so high and there's not loads of money to be made right now from the market, the big companies can dominate it and just run at a loss. So those big corporations that have already, you know, raised lots and lots of capital, got lots of backing from the alcohol industry, and et cetera, they're able to survive that initial struggle and that initial period. So for me, that is of concern. I think Canada is an example where, where the government need to do more to support craft brewers and new businesses. We see Canadian companies popping up in Jamaica, Colombia, all over the Caribbean. Are we seeing a kind of new kind of cannabis colonialism? So Canada, multiple US states are certainly years ahead of the rest of the world. It's meant that some of these corporations have accumulated already a lot of wealth, a lot of influence and a lot of ambition. So you were seeing North American companies engage markets and governments and groups all around the world to try and set up grow facilities, recognizing like we're ahead of the game. There's two sides to this. On one hand, good, they've got the capital. They should be trying to help other people lobby and change the law. But then the other hand, the way in which policy is created and does move, it can't just be a copy and paste of what's great for those corporations and big business. It needs to be a model and a system that works well in that community. And what about my favorite legal cannabis model, Uruguay? You love Uruguay. I love Uruguay. I'm smoking weed with the president of Uruguay at his farm outside of Montevideo. Lo que nosotros tratamos de enfrentar al narcotráfico, procurando organizar el mercado y sacárselo. Esa es la posición de, del Uruguay. Uruguay is interesting. They certainly have taken a stance on a model which isn't pro-business. In terms of their choice, so you can get access to five strains, and but you have to go to a pharmacy. If you're passionate about cannabis, if you enjoy homegrown, if you've got the, the space, the facility, the knowledge, or just the interest in growing cannabis, Uruguay is a good model because it allows that. It allows people to grow their own cannabis. There's an interesting discussion to be had there as whether you go for a, a model and a market which is aimed at consumers, we want to create a market, we want to create industry, we want to create business, or you say, uh, actually, we just don't like people who currently possess have been criminalized and we think people should grow their own. The rest we're not too bothered about right now. Yeah, cannabis is a great gateway drug to gardening. Um, so who's top of the league? Who's bottom of the league? Who are we giving a gold star to? If we're looking at the issue of corporate capture, I think Canada is the country that has a lot of work to do. There certainly needs to be more attention paid to those smaller craft companies. I think Uruguay is interesting because it's obviously gone down a non-commercial route. However, they are still private companies that operate there that have won licenses and tenders to provide that product. So one of the problems with that corporate model is that many of the very people who were most harmed by the war on drugs are or feel like they're getting squeezed out of the newly emerging legal markets. 
Do you feel like the black community has access to the industry out west? Hell no. Fuck no, they can't afford it. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, it's cost so much to even submit an application. You know what I mean? I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then you have to show hundreds of thousands of dollars of working capital. That's why I had to continue to be an advocate to try to change some of these laws and break down some of these barriers so that we can allow some of the smaller people to participate and we can really uplift our community. Has anyone actually really done well in making social equity like really at the heart of their legal system? There have been some attempts to address the issue of social equity when it comes to cannabis. I'll just start with Canada. They've not done a particularly good job. Canada in their legalization didn't really consider this issue in a great deal of detail. And as we've just talked about, have been dominated by some of those big organizations. So New York, they're launching a legal adult use market. They've already got a medical market. Now what New York have been able to do is see some of the implementation of models, social equity models in other states. So they're seeing Colorado, they're seeing California, they're seeing Massachusetts. Now, basically, the, the models that have gone wrong or have had, that I would maybe give six out of 10, Colorado would be an example of this, is they've recognized the importance of giving back to the people in the communities who've been vastly disproportionately affected by prohibition. For a social equity program to work, yes, you do need to give people preferential loans and, and, and licenses, but you've also got to provide cash injections and you've also got to provide education and mentorship and support to make sure people's uh, programs and initiatives work. It seems like just a kind of base level requirement for any system would be expunging the records of people with cannabis convictions from the prohibition era, right? Because that fell so disproportionately on communities of color especially, right? I see this as one of the biggest issues we currently have with regards to legal regulated cannabis markets. There has no, been nowhere near enough expungement of criminal records, but it's been incredibly lazy. New York, again, is coming forward as a good example of automatic expungement. That's good. I like to see systems like that because many people that have been disproportionately impacted by prohibition aren't always aware of the fact that these things have been implemented. All right, so we're saying gold star New York, but let's wait and see. Canada must try harder. Absolutely, yeah. Canada definitely needs to try harder. Let's talk about medical cannabis. Over the countries where medical cannabis is legal, at least on paper, who's getting the best access and who's getting the worst? What I see with this is two very contrasting models. So in North America, people typically have quite a high level of ownership and control over their healthcare, and certainly the drugs that they're prescribed. Anyone who's a fan of the NFL like me, you see advert after advert for take this drug, try this drug, go to your doctor and ask for this drug. So you think, wow, okay, it's that easy. You just ask your doctor for a drug and you get it. That model, that private healthcare model, it's very libertarian in a lot of respects. My body, my health, I'm going to tell you what I want. I've seen the advert, I want that substance. And there's some problems with that, as we've seen with fentanyl. The rise of fentanyl off the back of the American opioid crisis is in part due to that very relaxed, you know, what do you want, have your medication. But when it comes to medical cannabis, it's actually quite beneficial. But there is a truth that they're very comfortable with a healthcare model in which you can walk into a dispensary with a card that identifies you as a medical patient. Here in Europe, we've seen some real challenges with that. So obviously our medical systems don't function in the same way. They're very bureaucratic, very heavy on reason, particularly the UK. You know, one thing that the people need to know out there is anyone in the UK could be legally prescribed cannabis. Just go online, find a private clinic, have a conversation with a doctor, and within a matter of days, you can be prescribed legal cannabis flower. However, it's still not available on the NHS. So you do have to go to a private doctor and you do have to pay fees and pay for the medicine. Outside of Europe, Israel is doing particularly well. So Israel has been ahead of the game for a while when it comes to medical cannabis. They've done lots of research. They've got lots of data. They've got lots of pioneering doctors, lots of pioneering studies, and they're doing okay. They're seeing a growing medical market. And that Israeli research is becoming particularly useful in terms of helping advance the causes in the rest of Europe. A lot of the patients I speak to do have huge problems with the system, particularly in the UK. And I think there's something that's been on my mind of maybe when we talk about social equity, actually medical cannabis has to be part of that with as a kind of disability as social equity. 100%. I, I think the voices of patients and the experience of patients are really, really important. And we should absolutely put them at the forefront of policy and be listening to their, their concerns and, and finding out ways to make that, that better. We have 1.4 million medical cannabis patients in the UK. 
and many of them struggling to access the drug legally through clinics. Now, some of that might be just be about awareness and knowledge. Some of that might be about price. But what's really fundamental and crucial is that governments, policymakers, and the industry listen to patients and create a system that does allow them to access it and does bring them out of an illicit market into a legal market. Who's top of the league in medical cannabis and who's bottom of the league? In the short term, in, with regards to access, I think you have to look at places like Colorado, California. Now that, will, that answer will upset a lot of people because it's not very medical. It's very much like if you identify as a medical patient, you can see a physician and you can get a card. But the reality is for me, that addresses the short term issue of people's lives being changed by medical cannabis. I think what someone someone else might say with more of a medical hat on, less recreational, is they would say Israel is a good example. Israel and Germany are interested because they're creating lots of evidence, lots of data, lots of research, and they're finding out more and more about strains and how they change people's uh, conditions and experiences you know, every single year. So Israel's probably the best example of a, of a, of a medical market but as an advocate and campaigner, I like the American model because it's just giving access now. It's helping people in the short term, straight away. What about the environmental impact of legal cannabis and things like industrial hemp being used for business? Hemp is interesting because it's an incredibly useful crop. You can use it for loads of things from building materials to rope, to clothes, to make CBD. It's an incredibly versatile, environmentally friendly crop. Yet. The illicit nature of cannabis and the stigmatization that's occurred with cannabis have led to policymakers to kind of fall over the issue of hemp. We've got this ridiculous situation now, particularly in the UK, where you can buy CBD, but we can't make CBD because the government forced hemp farmers to burn the crop. There's loads of things we can do with hemp, but because of the illegality of extracting CBD, the hemp market is struggling to flourish here in the UK. Globally, you've seen reform, you've seen change. China is doing a lot with regards to hemp. They've positioned themselves they for a long time. They're seeing the benefits of that. Europe's getting there, but you know, it's just the stick. It's the stigma. It's the stigmatization. As governments become aware of the importance of the discussion around the environment and around sustainability, I think hemp will increasingly come up and up the agenda. I guess one one last thing: whose model is the most fun and the most likely to tempt people away from the illicit market? This is the most interesting conversation for me. Fundamentally, it's got to be an enjoyable experience because if it's, if it's not an enjoyable experience, people aren't going to use it. And when you're creating markets, you need people to use it. So personally, I think the models that are coming up in the States are interesting. They might go a bit too far in terms of the market and lack of regulation for some people, but if you're a consumer of cannabis, they look like really interesting, exciting models. You can get a wide range of products, a wide range of strains. To me, those models are the most fun whether they're the safest, no, I don't think so. The Canadian model is probably a sensible in-between. The product diversity is increased, you can get edibles now, but essentially speaking, it's not, you know, they're still not allowed to market the products and there's still some limitations. Whereas you go to the States, it's the sweet shop, it's the cannabis sweet shop. So who gets the news on drugs trophy, best legal cannabis model in the world? Best in the world. You're gonna say Uruguay, I know you are. I am gonna say Uruguay. I think the best legal regulated model in the world is Canada. However, they have a lot of work to do, particularly around social equity. Now, I make that decision Canada over the States because I think they will get there with social equity. I think they will start taking that seriously. I think we'll start to address some of those concerns. So for me, it's very close between Canada and Colorado. But I think in terms of, if, with my UK hat on, What's the model that I think we should be looking to? What's the model we should be talking about as campaigners, as advocates? I think Canada's the best bet.